use that to illustrate a cognitive functional approach. So the first section of the paper, and actually there are handouts. section of the paper will focus on correlating familiar treatments of prepositions with the approach that I'm using. And as Stan noted, a lot of this isn't, the, the cognitive linguistics is brought in is not uh, brain surgery or brand new things, but simply a, a different way of looking at the data and, and ideally uh, drawing out some more uh, precision in our understanding. Um, and then to move on to discuss the interrelationship of prepositions, cases, and meaning. And the second part will explain how it is that one preposition can have such a wide range of meaning. And I've taken in on purpose as being the most frequently occurring preposition and seeming to be the most polysemous. Uh, the third part of the, uh, will apply this model to passages where translations and exegesis appear to subvert uh, important constraints of in. Now, to begin with, what we traditionally have seen uh, in terms of explanations of prepositions, we are very uh, familiar with portraying prepositional meaning primarily in spatial terms, so the classic lion pictures. Um, such a starting point is well supported from linguistics. Uh, Mortonet and Luragi and Horrocks all view prepositions as primarily spatial in their metaphorical representation, claiming that non-spatial metaphorical meanings are in fact extensional uses derived from moving further and further away from that, that core meaning uh, or that's, that core spatial metaphor uh, based on prototype theory. So if we begin looking at the, the prototypical uh, description of in, Laurangi states, quote, it is in its concrete spatial function, in mostly denotes location. And her hedge mostly has to do with mostly because she begins her description from Homeric Greek and brings up uh, into uh, Koine and beyond. And so early on, you had in serving the dual function that by the by Attic and Koine period, you had split between in and is. So in Homeric Greek, you'd see in used with uh, verbs of motion and to express direction. Uh, but then she goes on to adopt Evangeloise's uh, functional analysis where something more than simple containment or position is evoked. And this is the quote for, uh, from Laragi. It's a, it's a, this functional analysis describes the landmark as a container exerting dynamic control over the trajector. Uh, I know this is, re I recognize this is new terminology, but the, the landmark is simply the thing, in this case, that's, that's containing uh, the, the object from the, uh, from the predicate or the concept from the predicate that's, that's being contained. Um, and exerting dynamic control would be, I would claim, the, the kind of the innovation that cognitive linguistics is bringing into this. And we'll see, uh, see this borne out as we continue. Uh, so the landmark in its most prototypical function does more than simply contain. Rather, there's a, there's a bounding or a control exerted which allows for the various extensional meanings that we see in the different translations of the, of the preposition. So in its most basic form, cases have potential semantic range of meaning, and the cases are represented by the colors, uh, two different colors. And so in and of themselves, um, they have a, a certain amount of, of potential. Um, they're often associated with grammatical relations. So Laragi would say the accusative is associated with the direct object, the dative with the indirect object, and genitive with nominal uh, modification. But things are a little bit messier with the dative case, because as you go back to Proto-Indo-European, you had three distinct cases, the, um, the dative proper, the locative, and the instrumental, which by the time you come into, uh, into Greek, they have all merged into what we now know as the dative case. So if you've read in Robinson or Robertson's uh, large grammar, um, these are things he's discussed. And so the division of the subcases was maintained through the introduction of prepositions, where these particles um, explicitly signaled, um, signaled which of the competing relations was intended. So the bare dative uh, would allow for potentially either the dative, the locative, or an instrumental meaning, and the prepositions were a way of, of narrowing that down. So in terms of the idea I have, um, you have the, the, the bare cases having a certain potential range of meaning, 
and the prepositions are simply a way of narrowing down or making more explicit um, the, the intended meaning. So they, they would be narrowing the, the scope from the, the broader potential of a case. Um, and it's important, uh, I'm not claiming that the, uh, the prepositions and the case are simply the sum of their parts, uh, but they may grammaticalize into some something related yet distinct. So the spatial meta, the spatial meaning of the preposition combines with the case in order to explicitly constrain and thus narrow the potential range. Uh, combining the same preposition with a different case would thus lead to a different constraint. So when we, when we have prepositions with multiple cases, that's how we end up with uh, different meanings for them. So we would be wanting to look at in defining or describing a preposition. You would want to describe it in, in terms of the specific case. Uh, you're focused on rather than trying to, to come up with a broader meaning. Um, and it's also critical to recognize that spatial metaphors associated with prepositions are not universal. They're going to vary from language to language. They're, they're culture-based. Thus, we would not expect the semantic range of end to, be, to completely overlap with its English counterpart. Another, uh, this is not from staying out late last night. This is uh, actually to illustrate fuzzy boundaries. Uh, one of the important concepts in cognitive linguistics and especially prototype theory. Um, these boundaries are not discrete. As we zoom in and look at that, that center uh, preposition in the last diagram, uh, we're going to find, for instance, instances where the bare datum is used for a locative sense where we might have expected the use of in. This doesn't mean that the preposition plus case doesn't have a specific meaning, but rather it, it observes the messiness of language. Factors such as authorial register, how uh, Mark would choose to, to uh, describe something versus Luke, or diachronic shifts, um, these kinds of things. So uh, I'll be illustrating principles rather than, than rules as we move forward. So part two, and this is actually where your handout begins. So if you were trying to figure out where we are, you're, you're right in the right place. We're just beginning now. Um, in this part, we're going to look at the factors affecting the apparently wide range of meaning that we see in the lexicons, grammars, uh, regarding in. My contention is that the bounded containment metaphor, uh, where the landmark exerts dynamic control over the trajectory, can account for much more of the data than we might be led to believe from the grammars and lexica. And so to do that, we're basically going to deconstruct our common uh, metaphor that's, that's found in Stan's idiom volume and, and Dana and Manti and others uh, that, that's so familiar to us. So we begin with the most bounded possibility of a landmark, uh, bounding on all six sides. Example one in your handouts illustrates both the literal and metaphorical use, bounded, uh, complete bounded containment. Uh, the physical buildings in the examples completely contain, not just, um, just as the heart may also completely contain something uh, metaphorically. So this, this is going to be the most prototypical use of the metaphor where you have everything bounded on every possible side. But we can step back and look at what happens uh, when the landmark is, is less able to fully contain something. What happens there? The passages in example two illustrate the bounding on only five sides. It still matches well with our English metaphor of containment using in as reflected in the translations. Uh, we also can have a metaphorical use, uh, such as the report of the uh, the spread of the report about Jesus being portrayed as though it's being poured into a container, spreading out and filling, uh, much like a liquid would be poured into a basin. Uh, the report spreads, but Judea and the surrounding region bound the extent of that spreading. Stepping back and becoming <coughs> more removed. Uh, the next reduction of, of containment would be in, something like an incomplete perimeter. I'm making up these terms, so if there are better ones, I would love to hear them. Uh, but the goal is it's easier to describe it with pictures than in words. Um, but in this, in this scenario, you have the trajectory is not entirely bounded by the landmark, yet is still portrayed as bounded by the, the metaphor of the, connect, or of the preposition. So Luke 3, 8, we see the discussion uh, we can really see that the mismatch beginning to come about between our English N and Greek N, where we would much, much rather use something like among that would more ca naturally capture the correct metaphorical representation of, of uh, how we would describe it in English 
yet Greek has a much broader usage in terms of its, its use of the container metaphor with the preposition in. Um, we can also have um, a metaphorical usage, so things you can't draw a picture of, uh, irrealia, um, with days. Um, we can have, uh, and this is particularly the case with time, and those days um, is describing days as though they are objects among which something happens. So some, the event is situated in a certain range of days. We don't know which days they are because it's not specific enough, but it's um, a specific range of days, and therefore that provides a temporal boundary by metaphorical extension in, in the use of in. So the entities don't need to be physical or realist to exert metaphorical control over something. Then another step of removal um, is where only a single entity exerts bounding control over something else without completely enveloping it. Thus a hand cannot completely envelop a tool like a sickle or a sword, but as a landmark it nevertheless exerts dynamic control over the trajectory illustrated in example four. And then stepping one step further then metaphorically, uh, we see this extended in the phrase in mahare. Uh, in Luke's parallel to Matthew, uh, this passage, uh, Luke also uses the preposition in, which contrasts with the report in Acts 12, 2, uh, where James, the brother of John, was killed with a sword, but it only uses the bare dative. So here we seem to have, so it's not just that simply that it's an idiomatic usage, that this is just a, a set expression and how they did it. We find it with and without, and there seems to be a, a meaningful choice in the decision that they've, uh, that they've made. So the use of the bare dative with the report um, renders it a, a simple instrument rather than talking about the complex metaphor of control over the sword. And then the, the most removed, the least bounded, we're down to a single plane, just the bottom, uh, the bottom of, of the metaphor, or the, the bottom of the, of the container. Um, Yet, this is probably the most important piece of understanding in. It still exerts control over the trajectory by providing a boundary, even where there is no explicit visible perimeter. This is illustrated in the passages in example five. Uh, there may be no border checkpoint to define the fuzzy boundary between being in the wilderness versus not, or being in Galilee or not, yet these locations are still represented as uh, bounding the action. The dynamic control might represent the danger or loneliness of the wilderness or the political ju jurisdiction of a region like Galilee, yet it is still consistent with the metaphor evoked by the end. And then we come down to mismatches like John 4.20 and Matthew 5.25. Um, you would never be in a mountain, um, in, uh, or in, in Greek, you, you would be on the mountain, or on the, or in, the, in the mountain, or in the journey, using the preposition in, even though in English we would not um, prefer that metaphor, obviously. So we face a method methodological choice. Do we allow the use to be Greek and describe it on its own terms, or do we opt for describing the usage in terms of the preferred English metaphor which would be the position upon rather than the containment within. We have our own quirks in English. Uh, we travel on a plane, on a train, on a boat, yet in a car. All of these may be transformed into instrumental statements with the use of by, by plane, by train, by car. But if I were talking about something that happened in the plane, uh, the implicature would be that I'm talking about a snapshot, a, a slice of part of that journey. And for these reasons, it behooves us to uh, accept the Greek metaphor as described by Van der Rooys, wherein mountain delimits a specific bounded space, and a journey is portrayed as a container that the, travel, uh, that the traveler enters until the journey is completed, uh, much as we would do with, uh, in English with being on the train or on the plane. Uh, if, if I said on the car, it's also going to evoke a different picture than being on a journey. It would be something like me holding on to the Yakima rack at 50 miles an hour or something. Um, so one of the reasons for the messiness that we see with the preposition in is the, the range, uh, not its range of meaning so much as 
the, the landmarks and the, the potential of those landmarks to completely contain something. So as we become less and less able to contain something, we then end up extending into um, other metaphors and extending the metaphor beyond what would match well with English. So a cognitive functional approach uh, applying prototype theory allows us to, to better understand why we have these uh, uh, such a broad range, um, and especially in understanding the non-spatial counterparts to the, uh, the for the irrealia, and these graded uh, associations that we see with both physical objects and, and non-physical ones. So it may look messy from the outside, but things become much more motivated as, as we understand the factors bringing it about. So now moving into part three, what if? What if in really means in? I mean, what if the writers really chose in on purpose? What if the bounded constraint, this dynamic control notion, this metaphor actually worked and, and it was chosen against some other backdrop like the bare data or the bare data or the uh, Diopolis, uh, Diopolis, the genitive. There are a number of regular uses of in which run counter to our container metaphor in English, leading translators, grammarians, and lexicographers to claim an instrumental usage of in. However, Luragi and Bertonet restricted the instrumental use, usage of in to body parts, and even then they recognized that this is really a metaphorical extension that the, the, the circle with the, the single column, where it much like the hand, the hand is exerting control over it. So even then they're saying it's not really instrumental, but the instrumental term came from the mismatch with English. I found a curious thing in my research, uh, my, my extensive research that began in January, so I'm very much a novice coming into this, and this is a preliminary report on what I've learned. Um, but both linguists, uh, both of these linguists, Loraghi and Bortone, observe a strong rise in the instrumental usage that is unique to the Greek New Testament. So not unlike Melchizedek, the instrumental usage is not attested before or after, or really even in the papyri in the broader Koine. It seems suspicious, suspiciously like Loragi and Bortone base their claims upon existing descriptions rather than upon their own analysis of the data, um, as they, they don't really offer much support for the, their observations about what's happening in Koine. They simply observe and move on. Others have attributed the instrumental usage to the influence of the Hebrew preposition the via the Septuagint, but, but Bortone um, has provided a compelling argument against this view. It's not to say it's not there, but we see, uh, we're going to be taking a look at minimal pairs and choices where it's quite clear that Paul knew how to use an alternative uh, option that would explicitly mark instrumentality, yet he <coughs> chose in. So we have influence and we have, and so there are gonna be set expressions and I'm, I'm not discounting that, but just saying, what if the metaphor was really chosen on purpose? Um, so the question I began to ask was, what if in really does evoke a single spatial metaphor of bounded containment with dynamic control? And what if the New Testament writers used in instead of another option and they, they really meant to convey, convey this constraint as opposed to something else? Uh, and then Randall Booth pointed out to me in thrashing on my presentation the other day that we also have the uh, verb chraomai uh, uh, that encodes instrumentality in the verb itself. And in looking at its usage, it, uh, the objects of that verb are only found in the dative and the accusative, but never with a preposition and certainly not within. So you would, uh, oftentimes you'll find uh, redundancy with things to mark things in language for instrumentality. That's why you find uh, prefix verbs of motion with uh, prefix, you know, the preposition, same preposition later in the clause. That's an example of the redundancy. We don't find that. So it made me wonder whether there really is an instrument, instrumental use of, uh, uh, or whether can we say that in signals or marks explicitly instrumentality so let's take a look at some examples of contrasting pairs. So now this would be example seven. Uh, this is going to be out of order. We're skipping from seven. I think we'll come back to six. I it just seem to present this order. Most interpreters would treat the prepositional phrase regarding the spirit in Luke four one as an agent that leads Jesus into the wilderness. Yet in Luke two twenty seven, such a reading is impossible unless Jesus is somehow transported in 
temple. But if bounded containment is actually intended in both instances, where Van der Roy's dynamic control here metaphorically re represents an authority, locus, or domain out of which Jesus is operating, what are the exegetical implications then? Another example of this, this locus of authority or control is found in example six, uh, much more clearly, uh, which samples one of the many uses of in to signify a power or authority. The container metaphor would not evoke, um, the, if, if indeed in is used to evoke a, a, a container metaphor rather than instrumentality, um, what are the implications then, uh, exegetical implications? Um, we would then have uh, bells above, or the finger of God, uh, or by what, or in, in what power, the, 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 the to me, question uh, would be talking about source or dominion within which one is operating rather than the instrument by which something is done. What if in really means in, and the writer really intended to convey dynamic control over the contain, uh, through the contain, containment metaphor? Example eight illustrates the capability of writers to explicitly evoke instrumentality when they want it. Uh, we see this with Diatu, Diatu Thanatu Tu Kuyu Avtu. Even right next to what in every major translation uh, treats as a second instrumental phrase, the life of Jesus. But what if Paul really meant to evoke the bounded containment card, if, if that's what he pulled out? If he has the ability, a choice implies meaning, and he chose this preposition against this, and he could have used both in the same, same context, what are the exegetical implications? Uh, it would be, uh, the exegetical implication would be that the life, uh, the life of Jesus is being viewed as a locus or domain within which we would operate as believers, or uh, and, and this would be where I haven't worked through the, the theological implications of what I'm saying. So this would be where metaphor would be able to extend because it could, could be talking about relationship. It could be talking about authority. It could evoke a number of different things in terms of what it's actually representing. But the metaphor would constrain that. And that's where your context then would help uh, define what's being or at least narrow down the possibilities uh, of what's being described. Finally, example nine, uh, we see what seems to be a clear contrastive example between the bare dative, which would be an unmarked option to, that, that allows for instrumentality and is pretty much the obvious translation or description of what's going on with the water, but it's contrasted with the use of in uh, to evoke, once again, a locus or dominion within which those baptized would operate. And. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that there may be issues of um, uh, authorial register. You know, certain writers may do one thing. So I, I've tried to vary things, and I actually had a really killer example, a killer example, uh, but it got shot down. And it was in Matthew. The one time you find the use of in, or the reference to doing something in the name without in, is in Matthew, uh, I, I actually, I don't have it in the presentation, but it's, you know, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? And I was thinking, ah, they're talking instrumentality and not dominion or domain, but Matthew never used it within, so that was shut down. But it was really a cool example. Um, all right, uh, this pre pre uh, presentation has really only scratched the surface of the problem uh, uh, within. Um, and so here are some of my preliminary conclusions. First, and I want to say this loud and clear so to preempt any questions, I am not in any way advocating that we always translate prepositions with a single gloss. Rather, multiple glosses should alert us to the potential mismatches in the spatial metaphors between the languages that we're working with. So I'm not in any way advocating a single gloss, but rather a single metaphor. So much. Uh, goes to the next point. This is my first real study of prepositions, so I wasn't sure what to expect. But the treatment of prepositions in New Testament studies struck me as being in need of the same kind of revolution that Levinson and others began with connectives. The idea of understanding them on their own terms, regardless of their mismatch or of their, their translation in, in English. So we need to be sure that we're engaging Greek on its own terms so we don't miss key exegetical elements of the Greek metaphor. 
Um, third, if I'm heading in the right direction and, and this is valid, if this is valid, there's significant ramifications for exegesis. I don't see any instance where orthodoxy would be overturned. Instead, the shift would come in the form of the metaphor evoked. In some instances, it's simply a matter of a shift from doing the instrumentality, the instrumental version, to being, uh, meaning bounded containment this, with this dynamic control. I purposefully avoided treating the increased phrases, but closer attention to these uh, implications has made me in kind of a noisy reader as I'm doing my devotional reading in Greek. Words like, wow, hmm, huh. Uh, because I've never paid attention to prepositions. I've just simply taken the gloss that fits and moved on my merry way. So I'm repenting of that. Um, and it would be interesting to look at more of the connectives and see what the implications are. And finally, I began uh, noting the fuzzy boundaries of our categories, and it seems fitting to end there. At some point, the bounded containment metaphor, I admit, is going to break down. But I think it has a few more miles in it then we've taken it up to this point with, in, in our lexica and in our exegesis and in our translations, and I've purposely not tried to do anything with translation because Greek is Greek, English is English, we have mismatches. So it doesn't mean we would translate everything, but that, that may inform some of our translation decisions in terms of finding ways of, of capturing or preserving some of the, uh, the richness of this, that, that bottom plane that never leaves in, in any use of it, regardless of how um, uh, uh, removed it becomes in, in, in the spatial metaphor. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end and, and answer any questions. Great, thanks, Steve. I, I found this really, I need to point to okay, sorry. Uh, I found this very helpful and promising. I have a small comment and then a question. Uh, the comment is that uh, you might add another picture to your set here. In John 10, 23, we have Jesus walking in a stoa. So there you have something with a top and a bottom. But okay. okay. So small point. There you go. Um, so there's more ways to it. More richness in the preposition. Okay. No, but thank you. Thank you. That's a good point. Sure. Um, the question is, what, what are, in your mind is the difference between uh, Luke 7, 17, this is where you have a sort of the idea of a shallow pan and something that's being poured out. And later, uh, the, your set, point five, your set of Luke 3, 1 and Luke 24, 6, where it's in the Galilee and in Ente Eremo. How are you, why, why and how are you envisaging those as different? Uh, areas? Part of it has to do with the lexical semantics of the verb. Um, in looking at, in the lexicons and where, um, the lexicographers would say, well, uh, the, the use use of in with verbs of motion, as though it's portraying motion. In most cases, it's not. Um, position matters in looking at the preposition. So if it's if it's a clause initial prepositional phrase, or I should say pre-verbal, uh, if you've read the discourse grammar, I, I refer to that as a, a spatial frame of reference or some, some kind of a frame of reference within which the following action, I see, frame of reference within which the action takes place. So it's, it's delimiting something in which something happens. You have a couple instances where you do have a verb of motion, and I'll grant those, and you know, whether that's a holdover from diachrony. Um, but so that would be the, the first piece. Um, where in other places you have, um, you know, there, there is this moving with the report that's going out. Um, the point was just to say, in, in which, with, with the irrealia, the question is, which picture do you use? You know, do you use the bucket, kind of a bucket idea, or is it just a single poem? I have no idea. It all depends on how we conceptualize that irrealia element. What, do you, what, do we, what does it mean to do something in faith? Which, which picture would we use for faith? I'll leave that to the theologians or to other people. I, I don't know, but I would say we need to think and kind of conceptualize in this direction. Did, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Uh, with various uh, pragmatic ways of working work, but how would we go then about 
and the lexicographers or many of the grammarians and, and like LSJ, for instance. LSJ has uh, in, in their, their entry for in, uh, so it's not, uh, it's looking primarily at classical Greek. Uh, they, they note a, an instrumental use, and their two examples are the parade case examples are with fire and famine. And they say, you know, these are treated as, as instrumental, but then as soon as, they, as, as soon as they've said that, they said, well, this actually fits with the sphere idea because fire envelops things. And, and so it's not, they don't say, so it's not really instrumental, but they, they acknowledge that we don't really need this. It has more to do with the mismatch with English. And um, uh, someone makes a specific statement about that in that regard, that it, it, it has to do with English not doing this. I think that was Robertson. Um, I'll have that in the fuller paper, but I, I don't have that detail here. But I, some, some, so in that sense, they're a great ally, um, but the, um, I think Khan's gonna make the point, I read his paper, but about the, the lexicon entries might need to be reshuffled in terms of reordering the entries. And he'll, he'll talk more about that. So I can say that it, this shouldn't overturn anything much that we see in the grammars or lexica other than uh, restricting some of the mismatched things and putting it back into kind of Greek terms in essence. Does that, does that help? Or? I suppose maybe a more direct question is okay. how did you determine these uh, nine categories? Like you have a lot of Right. Um, I don't know that it would matter too much. I was trying to just provide illustrations of how we seem to have things that are less bounded and to show a gradation. So I'm, I'm less concerned about the which category it goes in because in each case, ultimately, it's that plane on the bottom that makes all the difference. That's the ultimate boundary, and that's what metaphorically is representing the control. And, and anything else is, is it may be speculative, and, and I'd say for that way, you can just kind of set it aside because it's not gonna change, um, it's, it doesn't fundamentally change the metaphor itself. 